But it's great to be here with you today and uh, with our old friend Ilio and his wife, Charmaine. And uh, in fact, I spoke to Tim Hall yesterday, Pastor Tim Hall, and uh, he said, Tell Ilio, he's been one of my best friends for many years. He, uh, in fact, a couple of things he, uh, I jotted down as he was speaking. He said, We work together, pioneering the AOG Church in Murray Bridge. Uh, and he said Elio was uh, used very powerfully by God, planting churches all over, opened up a number of churches in the Kurong area, spent lots of time in, the, in his pizza house <laughs> or place, and the, the family is very dear to him. He actually mentioned the fact that um, a bank robber got saved. Remember that? Yes, that's yeah, true. He, he yeah, robbed yeah, a bank yeah, twice yeah. and he, he yeah. got saved. And he decided, well, that's not the way to get rich. <laughs> the only way to get rich is give my life to the Lord and experience the riches of God in my life. Amen. Yep. We're going to turn to the word this morning and um, let's just pray. Father, we just want to thank you for that, uh, that your presence is with us today. We have that assurance. Because Holy Spirit dwells in our hearts. Yes. And Lord, as I minister your word, Father, I pray, speak to each one of us. Jesus, Jesus. Let this be a life-changing message for all of us here today. Let us go from this place knowing that we have truly heard from you. Change our lives, Lord God, that our lives will bring glory and honour to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 You know, um, we hear... Numbers of times on our TV screens, reset. You know, financial, banks, financial resets. Everything wants to be reset. Well, you know, I think there's also a reset can happen in our lives as God's people. And um, in John 17, verse 3, Jesus said, this is eternal life. And when you think of it, he's going to say, well, it means that when I die, I go to heaven. No, he didn't say that. He said, this is eternal life that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. Yes. So, to, to, so eternal life, when you give your life to Jesus, is to know God. And that word know in the Greek means to know intimately. Amen. Yes. It's a relationship that the Holy Spirit wants us to develop with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the title of my message this morning is Intimacy with God or Growing in God. You are as close to God as you want to be. Think about it. You are as close to God as you want to be. And the Holy Spirit is wanting to stir the hearts of the people because we've been bombarded left, right and centre, every channel, about this COVID thing and about the situation, bringing fear and trepidation to the hearts and minds of people and, and Christians are getting sucked into this fear. And that's why there's a reset happening in the spiritual realm That Holy Spirit is saying, hey, listen, I need to reset your thinking. I need to reset your walk of intimacy with God. I want you to be able to see that God has a purpose and a plan for you in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the difficulties and challenges that that we're experiencing right now. Um, In 1973, can anyone remember 1973? That was a good year. That's, that was the year that I got baptised in the Holy Spirit. And um, I was still in a traditional church, actually. And uh, I got baptised in the Holy Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit put such a hunger and a passion in my heart to get to know Jesus. Yes. In Philippians 3.10, the Apostle Paul said, that I might know yes. him. Amen. That word know means know intimately. It's not knowing head knowledge. You know, we know who our, your premier is. You know who the prime minister is, but do you know him personally? And, and the reset for us today is that God is wanting us to get to know him closer than we've ever known him before. He wants to develop in our hearts a desire and a passion for intimacy with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's a reset that's happening in God's people today right across the world where God is beginning to refocus our attention on the one that came to this earth, clothed himself with humanity, died on the cross for us so that we can have relationship with God. And so God, and so I said, I said, Holy Spirit, how do I develop this walk of intimacy with God? What do I need to do? 
And I was sitting in my lounge. I lived at uh, Tea Tree Gully, Ridge Haven, Tea Tree Gully for many years. And so I, uh, I began to cry out to God. And I said, Holy Spirit, show me how to develop this walk of intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I go about it? Show me what I need to do. And my daughter, who was four years of age at that, uh, that, that time, she just walked up and down the uh, lounge. She said, Jesus, she didn't know I was praying. She said, Jesus, come into my arms. Jesus, let me love you. Jesus, I just want to hug you. Jesus, I just want to kiss you. Jesus, I need you, Jesus. And Holy Spirit said very clearly to me, he said, that is how you start to develop a walk of intimacy. Don't complicate it. Don't confuse it. Just tell him you love him. Tell him you need him. Tell him you hunger after him. Tell him you desire him. In Mark chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, the Bible says Jesus went up into the mountain to pray in Luke's gospel account. But in Mark, it says he went up the mountain to pray and he called to himself those that he himself wanted and they came to him. If you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's because he called you to himself because he wants you to be with him. Aren't you glad? Yes. You can say hallelujah, praise the Lord. You won't make me nervous. <laughs> hallelujah. This is not a traditional church. <laughs> Glory to God. And so I began to have a look at this verse. And it says, he, he called to himself, those that himself, they came to him. And then the next line is what we overlook. That they might be what? With him. Yes. That's why he called us to be with him. Yes. You, know, at, at, you know, I think sometimes as Pentecostals, and I'm a chandelier swinging Pentecostal. <laughs> But I think sometimes we focus more on the gifts and the power yeah. and the ministry. Yeah. We look at his hands, not his face. That he might be with him. You see, when we spend time with him, we become more like him. Yes, amen. Amen. And that's the reset that God has purposed for your life and my life in this present moment, in this hour in which we're li living. God wants us to spend time with him. And then Holy Spirit gave me this verse. I began to develop and the Holy Spirit began to show me how I can develop this walk of intimacy. With him. Psalm 42 verse 1, you know it. As the deer pants for the water brooks, yes. Yes. so pants my soul after you. And uh, the Greek and the Hebrew language it's quite picturesque. If you say a word, it actually describes a picture. For instance, if you say baptism, uh, the Greek mindset would think, okay, baptism is a picture of a ship sunk in water where the water is in the ship and the ship is in the water. And so it's a picture that comes to their mind. And so as the deer pants... King David wrote the words, but it was written, the, the, the music was written by the sons of Korah. And here's David, pant he's writing this verse uh, and, and reminded of the deers that he saw panting in the shade. He's in the shade. Over across there is water. It knows that if it made an approach to the, to, towards the water, it may mean the cost of its life. So here the deer is panting. <sighs> I want water. <sighs> but it may mean... It might mean the cost of my life. But you see, the thirst becomes greater than the fear. Yes. When your thirst becomes greater than your fear, then nothing is impossible for you to receive from God. Right. You know, the problem with me coming out of a traditional church was the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Yes. I was so fearful of it. I didn't know what would happen. What happened if I got on a bus and started speaking in tongues? You know, the next stop would be an ambulance waiting for me. <laughs> but one night, my thirst and hunger became greater than my fear. Yes. And then I was filled with the Holy Spirit. See, I don't know if anyone's like this, but um, I used to say, God, I want the power, but I don't want the tongues. Yeah. 
It's like going to a shoe shop, a shop and saying, I want the shoes over there, but cut the tongues out first. <laughs> it comes with a package. Someone said, do you speak with tongues? I said, what else can you speak with? Think about it. That's not hard, is it? As the deer pants for the water brooks. Then the Holy Spirit took me to a verse in the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 4. It says, draw me after you. The New King James uh, says it another way, but the New American Standard says, draw me after you and we will run together. Singular, draw me after you and a plural response and we will run together. When you hunger and desire and long for, for a, the, the develop a walk of intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ, it creates a hunger of people around you, your family members. When they see something in you that's hungering and thirsting after righteousness, hungering and thirsting after knowing Jesus more, it creates a thirst amongst the people around you. Yes, Draw me after you. And I pray uh, today, church, that when you leave this place, that will resonate in your spirit throughout the week, throughout the month, throughout the rest of the year. Draw me after you. Make that a prayer. Draw me after you, Lord, and we will run together. As I began to study this aspect of intimacy with God, God began to unfold to me scriptures from the Old Testament and the New Testament. He brought me to the place where, where in, in Psalm 19, God said to Moses, he said, tell the people, tell the people, can I get down here? Tell the people that, uh, that I, I, I bore them on eagles' wings. I want them to develop in them to, to become a kingdom of priests unto me. And I want them to hear me speak to you so that they can believe you forever. When you do that, then I will be able to speak to you and they will know that it's I that is speaking to you. And so God had all this set up. But then he told Moses, he said, Moses, get down to the mountain quick and tell the people, don't try and climb the mountain. Don't even touch its base. Don't get anywhere near it. And so set bounds, set a boundary around, a fence around the mountain. And I thought to myself, well, well God, why, why would you do this? Why would, one minute you're saying that you want to, uh, that you uh, uh, cause them to ride on eagles' wings. You, you desire them to become kings of a priest unto you. You want a fellowship, you want them to know you. And now you're setting boundaries. Why, why? And the Holy Spirit said to me, it's because they were stiff-necked. You know what it means to be stiff-necked? Yeah. Proud. But it also means unteachable. They can't be taught. And so the first leg, the Holy Spirit said, the first leg, uh, level of intimacy of your walk with God is the, what I call the outer, yeah. the outer circle. They saw the cloud on, of the, on the mountain. They, it, they, they knew it was the presence of God. And they thought, okay, well, we'll just worship from afar. There was no desire in, in them to want to get close to God because they didn't want to learn. And so we see here, you know, it was like, uh, it's, it's like, so Christians today say, well, I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. Remember the old song we used to sing? I'm on my way to heaven. I shall not be moved. Full stop. No movement. <laughs> and God wants us, and that's what he's developing in us today, a passionate desire. He wants to baptize us afresh with a passionate desire to, enter, to have that intimate relationship. See, the word intimacy means into me see. What does he see in you? What does he see in you? Does he see that you're responding to what he had put inside of you? What do you see in me? The outer circle. I'll go to church. I don't want the pastor to get on my back, keep ringing me up. Yeah, I'll, I'll occasionally read my Bible. I'll, you know, I may tell people that I'm a Christian, but I'm okay. I'm all right. I'm all right where I am. I know, I know yeah, I'm, I'm all right with God. But you see, there was a second level in, in, in Exodus 24 where God said to Moses, tell Aaron and his two sons and 70 of the elders to come up. And they broke through the barriers. 
They break through the barriers and they were able to go halfway up the mountain of God. And they, the Bible says they, they saw the feet of God on sapphire stone, pavement of sapphire stone. The second level said, I want more of God. I'm not satisfied at the base. I'm not satisfied worshipping God from afar. I want to come into a closer walk of intimacy with God. And if there's barriers in my life, I want to, you know what broke the barriers in their lives? I'll tell you what. In Exodus 24 verse 4, it says, Moses built an altar at the base of the mountain. What's an altar speak of? Blood, sacrifice. You know, the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for us so that we can approach a holy God. Come on, I want us to stand for a moment and we're going to honour the blood of Jesus Christ. We're going to thank him for what he's done in, done in our lives. Father, we thank you for the blood. Come on, let's lift up our voice. We thank you for the blood. Lift up your voice. We thank you for the blood. I'm cleansed because of the blood. I've been made whole because of the blood. I'm sanctified because of the blood. I've been set apart because of the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ has never lost its power. It reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. The blood of Jesus Christ will never lose its power. Thank you for the blood. Oh, I thank you for the blood of Jesus. Oh, it's washed me. It's cleansed me. It's made me me whole. I can plead the blood over my family members. I can plead the blood, Lord, over my own life. I can plead the blood over church members. Lord, I thank you for the power of the blood. Satan hates the blood. He is afraid of the blood because it reminds him of his defeat. Thank you, Lord, for the blood. Oh, we praise you. You can take your seats. And so we see the outer circle. The second circle they're both seeing the same thing. The outer circle is worshipping from afar. Inner circle have seen the, even the feet of God, the Bible says, and were able to worship. But here's a sobering fact. Even though they experience more of God, there is no real transformation. You know, I can get touched by God. I can fall under the power of God. All those things can happen to me. But if there's no change, if there's no change, you can get touched by God. Oh, I feel deep presence this morning. Well, what's it done for you? Did it drive you on? Did it motivate you? Did it create a hunger in your heart? Did you respond to what God had placed in your heart? You see, those 70 elders came down. They never confronted Aaron when the people said to Aaron, where is this Moses? Where is this character? Make us a God to go before us. You know, it's interesting. It's interesting. He said, uh, Aaron said to the people, he said, bring me the earrings of the women and children. Is it because that we're only women and children wore earrings or whatever? No. The reason being, if you want to get the next generation, get the women and the children, the mothers. Who has the influence of the formative years of our children? Our mothers, the mothers. And so I want their ears to be connected to the golden calf. And so Aaron listened. And the 70 elders never confronted him. They just went along with it. No transformation. Outer circle, worship God from afar. Second circle, saw God, his, the feet of God, but no real transformation. There's a third circle. And that's where God has brought you. In Exodus 33, Joshua God said to Moses, pitch a tent, pitch a tent out, and he pitched it outside the camp, and all who wanted to seek God can go outside the, outside the camp into the tent and seek after God. But every time, it never said they did, every time that Moses would go to the tent, the people, all the men, where's the men? All the men stood at their tent door and watched. You ever seen watching men in a church? Really? Is this it? Watching. They stood at their tent door and watched. Except one. 
Joshua. When Moses would go back into the camp, Joshua would remain in the tent. And what qualified him? What gave him a desire to stay in the tent? Because he loved the presence. And if you love the presence, young man, your life will change. Loving his presence. Love his presence. Joshua loved the presence of God. I love it when the keyboardists, pian- pianists play after the service, the service is just coming to an end, and people just sit in their chair and just, they just wait. They, they linger. I call them lingering Christians because they love his presence. They don't want to rush out so quickly. They love to experience and be bathed in the very presence of God. Joshua. He went further than Aaron, up the mountain. Moses said, uh, when Moses, God called Moses up the mountain again, Moses took his servant, Joshua, the son of Nun. He didn't have any parents, poor black. Son of Nun. No, doesn't mean that. His father's name was Nun. I know some of you are catching on. Uh, the word nun in Hebrew means the one who increases. And young people? He has got to know. Young people, I want you to be able to say, listen, I've seen what happened in Pastor Elio's life in ministry, but I want more. I've seen what the older Christians have done. Yeah. You know, the, the problem with us as older Christians we love talking about the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they were great oh, days. They were great days. <laughs> but don't live in them. Let them motivate you, but don't live in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Praise God. Don't live in the 70s and 80s. But remind yourselves yes. what happened Amen. to propel you, to stir your heart and say, there's more. more. There's yeah. more. Yeah. I want more. And Joshua was able to go almost to the top, top of the mountain. Aaron didn't. In fact, God actually told Aaron, told Moses, bring Aaron with you the first time, but he never went. You check it out. He never went. And so he listened to the people more than he listened to God. And if you're in leadership... Listen to God first before you listen to people. And so you have the outer circle, worship God from afar. You have the second circle, saw the feet of God. Doesn't appear any real transformation. But then you have the third circle. Joshua loved his presence, loved the presence of God. But then you have the last circle. Moses. Moses said, Joshua, you stay here. I'm going further. And the Bible says God spoke to Moses face to face. In the Hebrew, it means mouth to mouth. Just had a conversation. Is is it only for Moses? Only Moses can have that privilege? No. No, it's open for all of us. I'm not there yet, but I'm climbing that mountain. I want you to come with me. Anyone knows where Mount Remarkable is? Mount Remarkable? Good. That's near Melrose, Port Perry, this side, over the mountain is uh, Mount Remarkable. When I was 10 years of age, I climbed that mountain and I got caught up in a shoal, you know, shoal rocks, and I came skidding down and I was able to grab hold of a gum tree. And that's why today I can't stop singing, give me a home among the gum trees. And I kept gra- <laughs> I, gra- I grabbed the, I gra- and if it wasn't for that gum tree branch, I may not be here to tell you the tale. It takes effort to climb a mountain. It takes determination. It takes willpower, God's power, to climb the mountain of God. Who shall ascend in the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand before him? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, and so on. Moses. And I thought, well, God, what was the 
key to Moses' life. Why was he able to go further up the mountain than any other person? Why? You know why? He was the most humble person on earth. Humility will take you further. Humility says, I'm totally dependent on you, God. Humility says, apart from you, I'm nothing. Humility says, God, I can't do it on my own. It's the John 15 principle. The vine and the branches. I can't live without him. It's the John 6 principle. Eating, we heard this morning, eating, eating his flesh and drinking his blood by faith. I'm appropriating the merits of his broken body and his shed blood. And so Moses had this an amazing communication and fellowship of intimacy with God. So much so that his face shone. You know, his fa- the, the, the glow on his face faded. You find that in Corinthians. It faded. But the glory that's inside us should increase yes. daily, more and more, where his presence is seen. And so as I looked at those verses and uh, began to think, well, God, I, I, I want to learn to grow into intimacy with you. Help me. And as I said, I kept crying out to God, draw me after you. Then I saw a corresponding illustration in the New Testament. Amazing. Jesus had his 70. Had his 70. He gave them power to go and heal the sick and cast out devils. And they came back and they rejoiced and said, Jesus, the demons are even subject to us in your name. And, uh, but when he started to talk about some hard issues that they could not comprehend and understand... He said, you find in John 6, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life in himself. It means that I appropriate the merits of his broken body and his shed blood. When he said, they couldn't comprehend that. They couldn't understand that. So what happened? The Bible says they, they, they drifted away. They yes. moved away. Yes. Yes. But then there were 12 that he chose that they might be with him. Then he sent them out. First to be with him, then he'll send you out. Don't look for the gifts and the ministries first. Look for him first. Sometimes we can focus more on the, 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 the baptism than the baptizer, the healing than the healer. Focus on his face. But out of the 12, there was three. Peter, James. John, they saw things. They spent time with him, ate with him, saw the miracles, heard him. He taught them things. They had this incredible ministry, Jesus ministering to them, speaking to them, giving them insight and understanding. It was just amazing. It must have been an amazing experience that they had, these 12, for nearly three and a half years. But out of the 12, he chose the three, Peter, James and John. And the Bible says there were four things that they saw that the others never saw. They saw the raising of Jairus' daughter, Peter, James and John. They saw the power demonstrated, this little dead child come back to life. They saw the cost of their salvation in the Garden of Gethsemane. He began to explain to these three about end time events. At the Mount Transfiguration, they saw him transfigured before them. Just those three. Amazing, saw him transfigured before them. But out of the three, like Moses, there was one. He was called the Beloved. I think it's five times he was called the Beloved, five or six times. The one whom Jesus loved. At the Last Supper, listen to this. At the Last Supper, Jesus said, there's someone here who's going to betray me. All the disciples looked at one another and thinking, is it I? Is it I? Oh, mate, I hope it's not me. And Peter, beckoning John, he said, John, John, John. 
and ask the master, who is it? John, who had his head on Jesus' chest, knew it wasn't him, so he never asked the question. Is there anyone who can ask? And he looked up to Jesus. He said, Jesus, who is it, Lord? And he, Jesus said, the one I give the sop to. Obviously, as you know, Judas. John, John knew it couldn't be him because he was so close to Jesus. When you got your head on someone's chest, what do you hear? He was hearing the heartbeat of Jesus. What's the heartbeat of Jesus saying to you and I? Respond to what I've placed in your heart. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. Desire to know me more. Desire my word. Desire to spend time in my presence. Because in my presence there's fullness of joy. In my presence, your face and your life will change and become more like me. What is it for the world? None to perish, all to come to repentance. He wants you and I to come into that relationship of intimacy with Jesus. Just put some worship tapes on. Say, Jesus, I want to know you. You know, the, uh, the most precious thing that you and I have, what do you think it is? What's the most precious thing that you and I have? It starts with T. Time. Time. I'm so busy. You don't know how busy I am. It's all right for you to do. You know. You're retired now. No, I've ref I'm refired. <laughs> time. Got to make time. Got to make time. Take time. Spend time. Make that. In, uh, in Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 4, draw me after you and we'll run together. What happened was, the, the, it says, the king brought me into his chamber. The word chamber there is the same word that Jesus used in, in Matthew, chapter 6, verse 6. And it's, it's, it, the Greek word there uh, it means the place where treasures are stored. So when you say, Jesus, draw me after you, he brings you into his chamber where treasures are stored. But there is another meaning. In the Latin Vulgate of that, that particular verse brings the clearest meaning and the closest meaning to what that word verse actually means. Listen to this. In the Latin Vulgate, it goes like this. He has brought me into his wine press and set, set love in right order. What happens in a wine press? Grapes are squeezed. Pips, skin removed, and just the purity. When you say, Jesus, draw me after you, he brings you into his wine. He says, okay, you're simply responding to what I've already put in your heart. And now I bring you into my wine press because what you thought were priorities may not have been my priorities. You have priorities in your life, but they may not be my priorities. I want to reset your priorities. So the number one priority for your life that I have for your life is for you to come into that place of fellowship, of intimacy, with me. Relationship. Yeah. It's relationship. You know, without intimacy, no children. You think about it. Without relationship, without intimacy, no children. God wants to bring the unsaved to this house. He wants to this house to be a blessing, to be a lighthouse, to be a place of healing. I, um, 
I had a dream the other night and I wondered what it was and um, I see, I've got it here and in the dream I was just surrounded by lots of birds I was trying to make my way and these birds were just hindering me they weren't pecking me per, per se but they're hindering me from making from moving ahead from going ahead and I woke up and I said, Holy Spirit, what was that all about? It's all around my head, all around my head. And Holy Spirit said to me, this is, this is not a word for you, this is a word for God's people. That some of us feel that our progress in God has been hindered by activities, by things that the enemy would try to do to bring, this is by harassing me. You've been feeling harassed. You've been overwhelmed by them. You've been harassed by them. You've been surrounded by these things around me that's trying to hinder me in making my walk and progress in the things that God has me. And what happens when it does that, then it starts to bring fear and doubt that God wants to break that off of you. And if that's you this, this morning, I'd love to pray for you. Um, with yourself, Ilio, and your dear wife, I felt the Lord uh, say something to me about, about you. I've been praying about this. And, uh, you know, the Bible says God answers, uh, always answers by fire. And over the years, you have uh, built altars in different places, altars. And uh, I was thinking about the story of Elijah when he built that altar. And uh, when it was laid in place then the fire fell and the Holy Spirit said to me that you have laid the altars in your life personally, in your family your life as well but in the life of the church not just here in other places and the Holy Spirit says I haven't forgotten that, I haven't forgotten the fact that you've laid an altar for me and the fire of God, it's a fresh fire that's going to come upon you it had to, and your knees have no bearing with it. Nothing has any bearing upon this. It's the fire of the Holy Spirit that's, oh, that's going to bring the purpose of God to bear. There's still things you've been wanting to see. <laughs> There's still things you've been saying, God, you know, can't you see I'm getting old? He said, what's old? You're not old. What's, uh, if you want to talk about old... I've been here from eternity past. <laughs> Remember Methuselah? <laughs> but I bet there's a fresh fire coming on you, brother. A fresh fire coming on you. And God is saying he hasn't forgotten. He hasn't forgotten the altars that you've built. And uh, the wood had been laid. And God says, fire. That fresh fire is coming. It's coming. And it's sooner than you think. You know, maybe you're here this morning and maybe you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you do. Or maybe you're saying, well, God, you know, yeah, I did give my life to the Lord, but I'm not walking as closely as I, I would like to. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Thank you. Holy Spirit, you've spoken to my heart and I want to acknowledge that. And uh, yes, I've been walking from afar like the Apostle Peter he walked from afar following Jesus. But this morning, I want, to, I want to be drawn closer to you. If that's you, while well, every head is bowed and every eye closed, if you don't know Jesus Christ personally, or maybe you had once known him, but you, you know that you're not walking as close as God wants you to. If that's you, this is not a condemnation. This is simply God appealing to you to come back into that close relationship that he longs for you to have with him. If that's you, just put your hand up and put it down. Just quickly put it down. Thank you. Put it down. Anyone else? Quickly, thank you. Anyone else? Just put it down. Anyone else? Just put it down after you put your hand up. Anyone else? Just put your hand up. The second appeal that I want to make is that God, I believe, wants to baptise us with a fresh passion for Jesus. 
a fresh passion to come into that walk of relationship of intimacy with him. And um, I want to give you this opportunity this morning to respond. Just while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, just Holy Spirit, I pray, baptize me with a fresh passion to know you. If that's you, just raise your hands right now. Numbers of people, thank you. Numbers of people. Third appeal that I want to make is if you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Look, I've been in many parts of the world, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, India, Africa, many places. And there's a hunger that is beginning to develop in the hearts of people more than ever before. And that's to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, I don't want to embarrass you, but it's, it's a gift from your father. It's the father's gift to his child. And please, before you leave this morning, please let Jesus baptize you and fill you to overflowing that you may speak to your heavenly father in the language of heaven. It will change you, your life forever. In Jesus' name. Father, I, I pray for every person here. Let's all stand for a moment. Lord, I just pray, God, for a, a fresh fire to fall on us. I pray, God, that you'll fire, fresh, refresh us. Just raise your hands to God. Why don't you just breathe in afresh? And God, I'm receiving a fresh fire from heaven. I'm receiving a fresh fire from heaven. Holy Spirit, I pray, baptize me with Holy Ghost and fire. Fresh fire in Jesus' name. Oh, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us.